Yeah. So just a small question since you mentioned inhibitors. Does it only inhibit uh, restart and shutdown, or does it also apply to suspend? I uh, not to everything. All the uh, uh, all inhibitors. So all the inhibitors that go in these supports, we have this new, new um, more intuitive, according to me, way of doing that. So suspend as well, yes. But to add to this, inhibitors are of different types, right? So it applies to the, I mean, how you call the inhibitor also matters. And uh, this is, in a way, a break of the, like, the Unix uh, root is God mode. And we like breaking Unix. Yeah, so uh, you were mentioning that some significant feature was uh, implemented by an outreachy contributor. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Which feature was implemented? How was the relationship in general with the contributor? How did it go? How did it go, essentially? Uh, so the, the feature that we mentioned is blue screen of death. It's a, um, a thing where in, if in early boot the system crashes, instead of displaying nothing or maybe a little bit of logs, it shows a, a, a screen that says, well, in a graphical way, your machine crashed. Uh, here is a, a, your, a QR code you can scan to get more information. Uh, and... Um, yeah, and the relationship. Uh, so uh, working with new people is always hard, and it does, you know, like for for outreach interns, it's kind of the same. It's a bit of a overhead for us, but I think it's satisfying to to have new contributors and to introduce new people to the project. Uh, yeah, it was actually really nice working with uh, uh, the contributor in this case. It was very enthusiastic. That was great. Uh, just wanted to mention, like uh, uh, the. The blue screen of death stuff, it's triggered by simply logging at a really high log level. Um, so uh, that basically, yeah, if any component of the boot logs at an emergency level or something like this, uh, then it will, yeah, uh, then, well, then it will trigger the thing, right? Um, and you have to be privileged um, because otherwise <laughs> unprivileged stuff could use, uh, misuse this. And just uh, to, to add to the PSOD stuff, so it currently only shows the, the entry that triggered the PSOD and I, I think we should just do extend it to show the last few logs just like what kernel is doing it might make QR code larger but I think it's necessary so that you give more context on the error thank you yes and I want to add on process um, so yeah we've been working with Outreachy for I think three years now I think we had two interns the year before there was the uh, hibernate on uh, low battery thing um, so I think the hardest part for us is that, I don't know if you're familiar with how Outreachy works, you're supposed to do an initial interview period, so where you have on your repository beginner's tasks that uh, prospective applicants can pick and do to show that you know, they can work on, uh, in the language you use and in the technology that you use. And that is what we struggle most with, I think, because it's, it's really hard to have this list of things that, yes, they are doable, but they don't get done already when, uh, when these people show up. So I think that is the thing we struggle most with. But other, other, other than that, yeah, it works well, I think. And just as a brief follow-up, so, and the initial ramp up of the contributor was relatively straightforward, or did you have to do a lot of work to get them to start, essentially? Can you, can you repeat, that? please? I, I was yes, so the question is, how was the initial ramp up of this contributor? Did they immediately manage to work properly, or did you have to do a lot of hand-holding, essentially? Um, I think they're, they're, they send us really good candidates. And, and given we have this, so the good thing about this selection process where they have to contribute is that you do the initial ramp up before the project, the actual internship begins, uh, because they already have to, you know, uh, code and submit pull requests, they have to work, they have to uh, run the um, MKUs IVMs with the new version they're working on, for example. So when the internship starts, there's already a lot of work already done, which is kind of good in that way. It's <clears throat> Uh, yesterday you asked me a question if there is anything you could help us with uh, with our in our work uh, I kind of forgot and, and today uh, a thing appeared to me a, a feature request because uh, this is what we from time to time struggle with could systemd detect early 
when it starts if kernel supports all the features it needs. I know kernel because we, from time to time, we take different uh, kernel dev configs built for, uh, for a new board or something and, uh, and system D crashes. And uh, it's, it's like, you know, office knowledge, now take this dev config and, and turn this on and this off and, and, and so on and so on. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's frustrating to, to, to not to know what happened very early, probably earlier than this system, the blue screen of dev can, can function. Uh, I mean, we document this nowadays quite extensively in the README, right? Like it lists all the config X, config Y, config and so on that you have to turn on. But this is to some some degree even uh, like not. We cannot answer that very early on because many of the of the things that we want, um, we only use much later. Like I don't know, in UDEF will recognize this, but not PID one yet or. I don't know, we need some functionality for crypt and roll that you have the DM, whatever. So I don't think we can say this really early on. Or the stuff that we could say really early on is the stuff that hopefully in most cases you would probably... Well, okay, I mean, I'm coming from a different position there because, I mean, to me, some things are clear. Like, for example, that C groups needs to be turned on. I don't need to think about this, but I understand that this might not be the common baseline that everybody is on. Um, so... I don't know, we can certainly make better error messages, right? Like, but the thing is, like, we never run into them, right? So uh, we don't know about them because we never see them. Uh, so I don't know, if you find a situation where you turn off some option in the, in the kernel accidentally and then realize it doesn't boot and you saw some cryptic error message that made no sense to you, um, and then you figured out this is about it, just file a bug and we'll, uh, like, we actually have a specific label on GitHub that we put on things like this needs better error message. Um, uh, so that, the, uh, that that things uh, um, uh, become more discoverable. But I, I would really like to treat it like that, right? Like, so instead of us checking for kernel features, I would ask us to always just use the kernel features and make sure that when we realize they aren't there, uh, we log about them. Either gracefully, because we can continue um, and uh, we don't strictly need them, or, or uh, fatally, um, and then with a clear error message. If, that works if for you. I remember correctly, the, the problem we had like two weeks ago uh, was because uh, some of the early API file systems uh, was unavailable and there was no clear message which one. The, the, okay. this file, is, file a bug. Um, this sounds like something where we should just improve the error message. Yes, yeah, because... We, the, we, we fix things like this all the time. And, uh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to, 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 uh, to colleagues. Thank you. So while the mic is being delivered, uh, we forgot to do a round of introductions. I mean, we did, uh, but not on that side. So, so you and Mike, can you say a short word about yourselves? Okay. I'm Yu Watanabe. Uh, I'm mostly managed, uh, working on networkd and journalD and UWD, and I'm working on uh, at Red Hat. So I'm Mike. I've been working with System Streams for almost two years now. I'm uh, from Sine High, and now I I moved to Germany. I can do all sorts of social and uh, the conference works with. Real, in real life, and I think it's wonderful. And uh, I like the uh, learners version on TPM, but I never bothered to look into the internals to actually develop thing. Uh, I'm mostly focused still on like bit one and logging the all the basics, user space stuff. Oh, and I'm Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's the guy in the middle? Um, uh, my question is. Uh, where do you guys see Network D ending up in the Linux ecosystem? Do we see it replacing on desktop Network Manager or uh, being the de facto standard, or are you going to leave that up to distros? Where, where do we see Network D will replace I and mean, will become the, like the desktop uh, Network Manager? Because it's the year of the Linux desktop. So, so before before you answers. Uh, um, from my point of view, uh, Network D is, has very good ideas, and I really like how it is like deploying Network D and keeping it 
on the server is, is nice. And some of the concepts have been flowing, for example, into Network Manager. Uh, and it's much easier to, to configure it using files now than it used to be. Um, I don't know. It's a, well, that's part of the answer. So, you know, right now, like all the hyperscalers and stuff, it's all Network D stuff, right? Like what isn't the Network D world is, is desktops. So, uh, um, like, I think that the, the, the main missing part is that we have a same IPC API. And this is partially the problem was that DBus is only available during late boot, right? It's like the network manager people have the same problem. They came up with f things that I think are crazy that they actually run DBus now in the nerdy and things like this. Um, but things are getting better there, I like, because, you know, I have this other talk about Varlink, and it kind of... I'm, ex I'm excited for Varlink. Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know, like, I think we should, we should add that. But then, you know, just having, having the IPC is one thing, actually getting the desktops to actually integrate is a completely different one. Also, um, I mean, they, they generally focus on different technology, like Wi-Fi is a lot more important on, on, on desktops than it is, happens to be on servers. So, uh, uh, we, we would need some integration there. But, uh, I don't know, like, I don't think it's, uh, uh, I, I think we have a good chance to win that thing too, yeah. but uh, you know, from my personal background, this is not like uh, I don't know. Like we're, I work for a hyperscaler. This is where our stuff is used, um, and I don't know. Like, but I would like to see it. Uh, I'd like to know the audience who use the network on your laptop. Please hand. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> quite many. So, uh, if if there is a GUI tool, then do you want to network it on your laptop? No. Well, sir. By, by the way, just to mention this, like yeah. I on my laptop run Network D and Network Manager side by side. I use Network D for all the stuff like container and spawn uh, VM spawn networking, uh -huh. and I use Network Manager for the Wi-Fi. So mm. that doesn't count. <laughs> All or nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Okay, maybe a question for Mike. Not really a question, but more of a suggestion, because it struck me that in, during the earlier talk, you mentioned that you have a bit of a lapse in the QA, or rather a gap in the QA, when it comes to non-x86 architectures. As it happens, yesterday I was at the talk about BPF trace, and they were talking about their CI setup in order to be able to test against multiple architectures, and they have a tool for that wrapping QMU, obviously, um, called VM test. That might be something you want to look into, because they also have a GitHub Actions-based CI setup. So we could do cross-architecture QMU. The problem is that it's horrendously slow. So our, our tests take you know, uh, when you have KVM, it takes half an hour for a full run on a good day, um, longer sometimes. If you go across architecture without the KVM, it takes a full day. It doesn't work, right? That's the problem. We need, we need resources or money or sponsorship for native runners for other architectures. That's what we really need. Also, does that work recursively? Because many of our tests do spawn VMs, right? Like when we always had trouble with running x86 VMs inside of x86 VMs on the on the CIs. I'm not sure if, if you actually start emulating things, if you're going to be happy there. I don't know. But uh, it's it's mostly like if somebody wants to, to uh, contribute their workforce in, in making a CI run like this, we would, of course, be very welcome and uh, would hook it up and be happy and look at the CI. We, we actually try to, to look at the CI all the time. In general, the reliability of the CI is a huge problem. I mean, like for most people, uh, but for us, it, it's reliability and introspectability of the CI failures. Uh, another thing net uh, network related, not directly to network D, but rather resolve D. Uh, will Resolve D uh, support some API to to publish uh, MDNS uh, entries? Because uh, as far as I know now, you need to drop files uh, in ETC, 
and there is no uh, way to to control it dynamically like Avahi and uh, and well I'd love to see resolve the replace Avahi because it seems like e simpler better and and stuff so I have a PR outstanding that does something not that but uh, kind of related to it which is like this this ability that you can add, uh, define additional scopes uh, where we send requests to um, and that in a dynamic way so that uh, an IPC client can come via Valink and say basically uh, I want to define for a moment the scope now which is a DNS server, a set of DNS servers and, and, and search domains um, and then it's going to be included in the routing and, and, and things like this. But uh, um, related to this I like try to think about that precise uh, problem because I, I, not, I want it not only for MDNS, I want it also for local uh, DNS records because we have something like MachineD, for example, that registers uh, DNS records, like makes uh, local um, uh, uh, VMs resolvable. And even though that's a local thing and not a network facing part, it's kind of the same semantics, right? Like you want to install a couple of resource records, either that they're also visible to others or that they're visible locally. Um, let's just say uh, uh, I started working on it in a distant way. Um, uh, I, yeah, I would like to see that. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's probably going to be Varlink based because it has this nice thing that we can then basically give you, like the connection would be the, the object that tracks this thing. Um, like, uh, uh, so you actually have a nice life cycle and things like that. Send us a PR. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? So Luca, like briefly mentioned, um, you know, that you don't, you don't uh, have a hardware because sponsorship, funding, whatever. So what would you do if you had um, kind of like infinite funding for the SystemD project? We go on holiday all the time. <laughs> no, so I mean, I think so. On GitHub, you can buy more runners. Um, right now, we get sponsorship from GitHub and Microsoft. Uh, we get additional resources than you would get on a normal open source project, and we are very grateful for that. With infinite resources, yeah, we would definitely, uh, and not just a finite amount, but an ongoing income, we would be able to sponsor and, and buy more runners. And I think there are now ARM64 runners as well, but again, you have to pay for those, I think. So this kind of stuff we will do. And in parallel, um, uh, we saw we, on one of the slides, we have uh, done contracting work. So we will continue to use contractors to do the stuff that is less exciting, but needs done. Um, so I think these are the two things we would focus on. I don't know, other ideas here? Yeah. I would even say it in a different way. So the contracting work is, can be done if you can scope out something that is uh, like a, a thing and all the glue stuff will be hard to uh, do as contractor work. Uh, for this we need like people who are, are in the project all the time. So I, I wouldn't do this split of it, but exciting and not exciting. I think it's a different thing. Other ideas? Infinite money? So when can we expect the check? <laughs> Other questions? If there's none, maybe a question for Mike. So you're the only one on, up there who's not working for a big company. So how's your experience have uh, been and where do you want to take System D? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure from which perspective I'd be answering this. Like, uh, I value my current independence so that I, I'm not driven by some specific uh, requirement from the company, but from purely technical view. But I don't know. I think this, this might change in the future. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, yes, I. I Nobody pays me for it, but I just enjoy this. So, like, I've been continuously doing this for two years. So, that that won't be a problem for me. Other questions? How much? How much time do we have? Uh, five more minutes until Leonard's talk. <laughs> Thank you.
is there uh, anything the system D project would like to see distributions do different when integrating system D? Any pain points? Any? Well, um, one of the things that we discussed last week was uh, pain points in the kernel. So little uh, bits, uh, like for example, ButterFS not support supporting offline creation of uh, subvolumes, and ButterFS not supporting offline and um, um, compression, which I mean it's not, not directly a kernel feature, but it's done by the same people. Uh, and um, I don't know, like we, we have this huge UA, huge list of features on the UAPI uh, website, the, the kernel wish list. Um, so that's that's on one side, uh, and on the other side, in libraries, uh, well, strict backwards compatibility in libraries so that things don't break. Um, that's that would be my my list. Um, I have two things. The first one is. Um, in the upstream CI, uh, we saw on the slide, we cover Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, Arch, um, SUSE, Fedora. Um, we would like more distributions. Like there's more than the main uh, generalist distributions out there. Um, all you need to do is to make your distribution image buildable with MKOSI, and if you're package-based, that's it, it usually trivial. If you're RPM, it's super easy. Uh, or talk with Dan or with York there, and they'll help you out. Um, but if you do that, and then you send us um, upstream PR to, do the, to enable this, then we can give you test coverage directly upstream before we do releases. Because distributions are different, and we find issues on Ubuntu that are not there on Fedora, and vice versa. Um, so if you send us this integration, then we will test your distro for you before we do releases. So you will have less trouble when we do a release and you have to integrate it. But you need to help us and do the work, and it's ongoing work. Like MKOSI makes it, makes it easier, but it's still a bit on, of ongoing work, and we need some commitment there. The second thing I will say is that um, one thing that some distribution do well and some less well is the subdivision into packaging. So we are trying to build these small linear RDs now from packages in MKOSI, and uh, we would really like to be able to split up to have the systemd packages and other packages uh, at a more granular level for your basic system stuff, so that we can build smaller linear RDs and extensions on top of that. Um, and that is something, again, the distribution folks into that. For example, this is anathema to Arch. Like on Arch, you package everything in a single package, right? Yeah, so it's a I actually don't want that in Arch. But if this <laughs> yeah. is the way forward, it's the way forward. <laughs> Oh, and uh, I think it would be great if distributions would do hermetic slash user, if we can find agreement there. Um, some distributions started doing the SUSE, and yesterday we heard about, uh, in, in one of the, the, the lightning talks, that Debian, there's work ongoing. Um, I think it would be lovely if Fedora would do the same thing, because in the long run, I mean, we have no illusions, not a short-term project, but I think in the long-term project, it would be really great if distributions would, would start doing this. And regarding the whole CI um, discussion and, uh, and the infinite money thing, I think it's not, not so much about short-term money, is about long-term support for the CIs, right? Like, this is something I really would like to underline. Um, nobody of us is helped if we have some maintainer who who comes and sets up a CI system and then vanishes, um, because CIs are fragile beasts, um, so uh, we need continuous support um, so that somebody looks after this. And this is like, for example, from the Red Hat side, we have Frontishek, who's awesome for these things, and he just keeps looking about this year after year to, to keep it working. Without this, the CI would be garbage for us, right? So uh, it's not about short time stuff, it's not about setting up this once, it's a continuous thing and commitment, and that, that kind of marks it hard for people, I understand that, but we need this. So we are out of time, uh, thank you for the questions, um, and oh. thank you. let's move on. Thank you.